Welcome, everybody. I'm Rustin Smith. I'm the pastor of Vox Day Community. I'm here again with John Bowles from Beggar's Table Church. And uh, we're having a conversation today that's really the completion of a, a sermon series that we have shared over the, the weeks of Advent. And now here we are beyond Christmas, but finishing it up with something that I think is really timely because this whole series we have called Begin Again. And there is no better time of year than to talk about beginning again than when the year begins again. Yeah. The <laughs> whole course, culture talks about it It, now, it yeah. does. Of course, we talk about that as Christians in the church calendar with Advent because yeah. that's the beginning of the church calendar year. But gosh, we're at a, a season now where everybody's thinking about beginning again. Yeah. Does, do you do this? Do you get into this whole thing in January and... Um, well, yeah, with New Year's new resolutions. Resolutions and how you're going to change and be a completely different kind of person yeah. now that it's 2021. And, well, you know, I don't want to to negate that whole practice because I think yeah. there's something real healthy about it. But mm-hmm. I, I'll just tell you, Rustin, between you and I, I never do that. I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I adamantly resist the whole idea of I'm starting new on, on, really? on New Year's. Now, I will start new in other times, but it's just, I, I can't jump on bandwagons, yeah. you know, so. Right. Yeah, yeah you're no joiner. You're, yeah. Uh, I do think, for me, beginning again is probably most natural in the spring. Hmm. Um, and, and so I, I tend to do that more around Easter time. Uh, something about when the baseball season starts. Okay. I always think I, uh, the Royals are going to do it this year. You yeah. know, we all start out O and O, and it's yeah. the time to hit restart, and it makes me feel that in my whole my whole body. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I had a friend who was a huge Royals fan, and he would he would always say, "Man, hope springs eternal." Hope springs eternal, and so I feel that the impetus to begin again is great at Advent and New Year's, but I always feel it personally in the springtime. I would say, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well, normally, you know, gyms would be full uh, yeah. this time of year for a couple of weeks. <laughs> not this year. Uh, hopefully yeah. not this year. And I don't mean to poke yeah. fun at it either. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I think I'm basically laughing at my own failures as much as <laughs> just how we all fail so badly at this. Um, we're not very good at, at beginning again. And, uh, and yet I, I deeply resonate with the desire to mm-hmm. uh, over and over. In fact, it, I think of St. Francis. I always quote this about St. Francis because I love the humility of it. As a guy who completely changed Christianity in his day, completely revolutionized the world. I mean, he's truly an amazing, large figure who accomplished so much in his life. At the end of his life, the story goes that he says to his followers, let us begin again, uh, for up to now we have done nothing. Mm. And I'm like, man, if that guy did nothing, (laughs) what does that make me? Um, But really what it is is an invitation to take in every new season this uh, opportunity to to go, look, past is past. Past is not present. And what can we do now? Yeah. Yeah. It's beautiful. Now, just to review a little bit of what we've said, because this is our fourth week in this teaching series. Yeah. And we've structured it around the practice of remembering, literally Mm -hmm. putting back together, remembering something that's been shattered. And that that thing that has been shattered a lot of times, I mean, I think regularly in life, but especially in times like 2020, we felt it, uh, is is ourselves Mm -hmm. and our our understanding of ourselves. So we have to remember, and, and the way that we phrased it in our teaching is that our remembering, our putting ourselves back together or our image, our self image, uh, is it comes in like concentric circles, like when you throw a stone into a pond in the mm-hmm. ripple effect. Yeah. So it begins at the center of remembering who we are outside of anything that we do or say or think. Mm-hmm. And that's simply by virtue of being human. Mm-hmm. We are eternal beings, you know, created by God in his mm-hmm. great universe. Mm-hmm. You know, we're loved as dearly children, as dear children. Yeah. And then we talked the next week about the next ripple out was the things that we think or who we are and remembering the things that we think. Yeah. And um, yeah, keeping God before our minds. Keep which, God before which our you, minds. You did such a yeah. great job of uh, giving us an image of that that isn't just personal piety, but really a vision for how to how to have eyes that are open to God in in all things. And, right. Yeah. And then and then the last circle that we talked about was really the things that we do or the way that we live yeah. and the way we relate to um, yeah. each other and. And that's, that's right. and, and you did such a fantastic job with that. But uh, 
remembering to live specifically sacrificially. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so today we move into our fourth practice. Mm -hmm. And this is the real challenging one for me because this is the one that doesn't, that sounds the least sexy of all of them. Mm -hmm. and, but it, if you get into it, it's, it's yeah. really key. See, I and, thought that about the last one, but, but, <laughs> but that may be true. I may agree with you. I, I, I hear what you're saying, yeah. live sacrificially, but you can really yeah. put a spin. But anyway, this is remembering mm -hmm. that we need to have a plan of practice in yeah. order to do any of this. Oh, great. I, I, I know, a plan. <laughs> I like to say remembering that we are created in a way in which we have to have a plan of practice yeah. in order to do this. Now, this is obviously, as we said, really um, timely mm -hmm. because there's a reason not only why so many people make New Year's resolutions, but there's a reason why so many New Year's resolutions fail. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the stat is, but I'm sure it's around 90% or so. I mean, at least. Yeah. Uh, there, there's a reason. And the reason, I think, is because people don't understand that we're created in a way in which we tend to not transform or bring about transformation to ourselves unless we have a strategy. Mm -hmm. Or maybe a better word, Rustin, would be intentionality. Mm -hmm. We have to have an intention. Yeah. We have to have a structure. We have to have a plan and transformation, for the most part, I would say, I think I can be bold enough to say transformation does not happen without that. Hmm. So again, it's one of the not, least... Let's at least say not good transformation. <laughs> yeah, I guess there's... A, Things there's can a, always get worse Yeah, on their own. With on no on their own. That's the reason we call it sliding. <laughs> right. I backslid, you know, because yeah. I didn't have to try to slide. <laughs> But one of the least sexy ideas out there is that beginning again involves work and structure mm -hmm. and planning. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I want to uh, uh, use an author that I like a lot. His name is Austin Kleon. And my mm -hmm. congregation has heard me quote him before. Yours may have too. He wrote famously the book Steal Like an Artist. Yeah. And of course, he's written follow-up books too. And, and all of them are, are amazing. I highly recommend Steal Like an Artist. And, mm. um, and, and I want to give a shout out to Matt Appling that introduced me to Austin Kleon because it's been so transformational in a lot of ways. But nice. Austin Kleon, he's writing these books. First of all, please note, there's nothing stale or stagnant about this. He's writing these books to artists and not just artists, but creatives, people who want to create mm -hmm. and, and do amazing things in the world and create yeah. projects that uh, bring about, bring life yeah. and beauty and change to the world. Okay. So that's yeah. really exciting. But then his books are just really creative ways of guiding us into the reality that in order to be creatives who are really making an impression on the world, we have to have plans and we have to have structure. Oh, and we great. have to have routines. <laughs> so one of the things that you, I brought... You mean it's not enough just to read books about being creative when you're... <laughs> what you just said, reading a book about being creative, is probably one step more than most people do. <laughs> yeah. I'm laughing because I have a whole yeah. shelf in my study here of books about writing. About you know, you know, how all, to write. How to write and, and yeah. why you write. And methods of writing. I have a great book about writing and... I love it, but I get depressed when I read it because I think of all the things I'm not doing. <laughs> right. So, I mean... I'm this reading is, this book instead of actually writing. Yeah, That's exactly. Yeah. Yeah, how can I be as old as I am and still reading this book? I, uh, anyway, these are the dilemmas that go on in all of our heads when it comes to trying to actually... Yeah. And, you know, create something, but that's pertinent to this conversation because we're talking about uh, helping to bring transformation into our lives, which is maybe the most ultimate creative thing. Yeah. Um, so, but, but I, 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 I brought from uh, Steal Like an Artist, he has a, a chapter called The Life of a Project. And just to let you know, he says, uh, it's, it's like a bell curve, only it shapes downward, right? Okay, so like and, the, li the life yeah. cycle of a project. So he goes, okay. now, and, and this is just to, to bring right. sober reality to... to to what it takes to, to really create something. Mm -hmm. He goes, you start at point A, and so let's just say that we all start with this idea that we've all had before where we get an idea and we think this is the best idea ever, right? Yeah. So that's where you start. I spend a lot of time there. Yeah, and then it starts to go down, where I spend a lot of time too. And so the next point after starting is, okay, this is harder than I thought. <laughs> next point down, this is really going to take some work. So I, we all get to that place where we go, um, it's going to be amazing. And again, remember the correlation to our spiritual journey. Yeah. This is amazing. Yeah. I can't believe it. I'm a Christian. Okay. Yeah. This is going to be a little this bit harder, harder than, than I, I thought. thought. And then to get to that point where you go, 
is going to take some work. Is it going to take some work? Yeah. That's a good point to get to. Yeah, Austin is. Cleon is saying, this is, these are all healthy. Okay. This is part of the process. Okay. You have to go through it. Yeah. But we resist it. Yeah. And, and typically in Christianity, we think, well, I've done something wrong because mm. I feel like this is going to take a lot of work. Yeah. No, this is the way. So, so this is the point that where I stop my project and I go back to my bookshelf and read a book about doing a yeah, project right. and feel good about it. Again. Exactly. <laughs> but this is the way we're created. Yeah. This is the way we're created. So we go from this is going to take some work to even lower, this sucks. <laughs> and... It's boring. Usually when we feel like we're just working and working and it's boring. Yeah. And then I love that Cleon borrows language from our uh, Christian church tradition. Mm -hmm. And he borrows the language of John of the Cross. Mm -hmm. And at the very bottom of this curve is what he calls... The dark night of the soul, I'm guessing. The John dark the night yeah. of the soul. <laughs> so you get there. Yeah. But then it starts to go up and... and, and and you get to a place where you say, it'll be good to finish because I'll have learned something for next time. <laughs> like, of course, this project, it's never going to be what I thought it would be. Right. And again, the correlation with our spiritual life, yeah. we generally, if we're really doing this, then we get to that place where we go, I'm probably not going to be the superstar Christian I thought I'm I was going to be. Never going to be St. Francis. I'm not, right. probably not going to be yeah. St. Francis. Yeah. But, but, but when you're doing a project, yeah. you go, I've learned something. So yeah. that's, there's some so good in you're, that. You're, yeah. Yeah. And you're looking for moral victories yeah. uh, sometimes. So you're like, oh, this isn't going to be a huge victory. success, but we're going to learn something from this. So then where you end up on the other side of the curve is what Cleon says, it's done. And it sucks. <laughs> but it's not as bad as I thought. <laughs> you know? And that's just sober reality of the work that goes uh, into creating I anything. Mean, we but, are beings that are yeah. built to have to have a plan. And well, I, I mean, first of all, I feel like I go through that every week I write a sermon. Yeah, right. you just, exactly. And I'm usually leaving Sundays going, that was terrible, but it wasn't that bad. And, and it wasn't <laughs> as bad as I thought it'd be on Wednesday. That's right. Yeah, yeah, totally. So that's a creative process that you and I yeah. are engaged in every yeah, week. Yeah, so and, it does. I do see the parallels just in the spiritual journey or the, the journey of transformation, or even if you just think of it as like this, this season we're in of New Year's mm -hmm. resolutions and the things that I want to change in my body and my habits and mm -hmm. my productivity. Uh, I'm in various places already of those things of being excited about it. Uh, I got a new pair of shoes, so that's going to help with some running and yeah. Um, and then there are other things I'm already started in where I'm like, yeah, this is, I already feel the pain of how this is going to yeah. hurt if I'm actually going to yeah. follow through with this. See, I, this, I don't know how this is coming across to people listening, but I wish somebody had told me this kind of thing when I started Beggar's Table. Mm. I'm the founding pastor of Beggar's Table, so I had this idea that I would start something great. Yeah. And, you know, the beggar's table is great, but it's been a lot of hard work. And when I started, it was a lot of hard work. Mm -hmm. And it would have been so cool for someone to go, oh, hey, it's supposed to be. Yeah. This, is, this is the process of creating. I mean, yeah. I had none of this. I, I had none of this mentoring or these ideas. Yeah. So I think I, I spent a couple of years in the early days just going, well, oh, I'm doing something wrong. You know, no. I must really stink at this. And that's not true. This is no. just the way, this is the way we are created. It is. It makes me think of... I, I don't know if I can relate this story. One time I was going into an event, a conference that was a, a kind of an intensive weekend thing that was going to be very difficult uh, psychologically and uh, mm. it's kind of a, a therapeutic spiritual direction kind of thing. I had a friend who'd been through it before and he told me up front before I went in, he, he, I was trying to get details like, what's this really like and is, am I going to be able to do it? And he said, I just want to tell you, there's going to be a point at which you feel like you're go you want to quit. Mm -hmm. And all I can say is don't. Mm. And I called that to mind several times during the process that I was going through of like, oh, this is what he meant because yeah. I want to quit. And you know what? If he hadn't told me that, I might quit. Yeah. But he told me not to and, and predicted it. So that is interesting as we uh, kind of lead people into the Christian life. Uh, it has something to do with being honest about, hey, you're going on a journey and there are going to be parts of this that are hard. Yeah. So when we talk about plans of practice for transformation, personal mm -hmm. transformation, for remembering ourselves, mm -hmm. um, there are things that might, again, not sound sexy to people, um, such as a rhythm of life. Mm -hmm. um, so w let's talk about a rhythm of life in a second. But what I want to point out, I, I have one more thing to read from Austin Cleon, just mm -hmm. another chapter he wrote, mm -hmm. is about how we are made to flourish in routines. Mm -hmm. um, we need to set up a routine for ourselves. Mm -hmm. He says, he says, 
I, um, I suppose for some people, a strict routine sounds like prison. But aren't we all, in a sense, doing time? And then I just wanted to read this. He says, when, when rapper Lil Wayne was in prison, I found myself... Wait a minute, I got it. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm, We're I'm, reading I'm, from about okay. Lil Wayne. Here. Okay, go. He says, I found myself envying his daily routine. Now see, I thought this before, so I, this really resonated with me. He says, which consisted of waking up at 11, which in and of itself sounds pretty amazing, drinking coffee, making phone calls, showering reading fan mail, which takes up so much of my time, um, having lunch, finally, okay. making phone calls, yep. reading, writing, having dinner, doing push-ups, <laughs> listening to the radio, reading, and sleeping. That was the daily rhythm. And so Cleon said to his wife, I bet I could get a lot of writing done if I went to prison. <laughs> I've often thought, like when I think of this routine, I was like, I bet I could do a lot. If I, <laughs> So he says, a little imprisonment, if it's of your own making, can set you free. Rather than restricting your freedom, a routine gives you freedom by protecting you from the ups and downs of life. Mm -hmm. I love that. A routine protects you from the ups and downs of life, helping you to take advantage of your limited time, your limited energy, and your li limited talent. A routine establishes good habits that can lead to your best work. Yeah. Now, so we put this in the, the, the Christian, in the church context, and we have things like uh, a rhythm of life. I don't know. Yeah. Do you, do you want to yeah. let everyone know like what, how you've experienced the rhythm of life? And, yeah. And what well, I mean, means? first of all, I resist it. And the whole yeah. idea scares me as right. somebody who wants to just do whatever comes naturally to me. Right. Um, I think part of the journey toward a rhythm of life or a rule of life is the idea that what has come naturally to me just doesn't work very well for me. It works even less well for the people that I love. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so the movement toward rhythm uh, it has been a, it's, it's been pain uh, that has kind of driven me there or yeah. called me there or made it more attractive than, than not having it. Um, but as a, a rhythm of life, a rule of life, I just think we're, we're deeply rhythmic cr creatures. We get it from creation. We create our own rhythms. Even in the, we always say this in the church calendar, even if you take the church calendar away, uh, if you take calendar and time away in general, we still find ways to organize and rhythm our lives. And it's usually, you know, basketball season, baseball season, football season, uh, soccer, I guess, You're right. families, right? We, You're right? we naturally organize stuff and we will naturally do it in our own lives. But if we, are, if we leave it to what comes naturally, uh, that's usually going to be a slide towards something that is probably not going to serve us well. Well, the dominant culture has a rhythm. And, and it, it imposes that rhythm on us. Yeah. So we live according oh, to the school That's year right. or, or, like you said, sports seasons. Yeah. Or, yeah. I think it was Thomas Merton who wrote about the, the church fathers, just the, the early Christians um, who found themselves in dominant Roman culture and going, wait, this is not working well. And they, they honestly saw culture as, or this experience of being a human in culture as kind of being survivors of a great shipwreck. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like everybody's in this open water and it's every man for himself. Mm -hmm. And so whatever way the current is going or the wind is blowing is where you're going to get swept unless you are intentionally swimming in a particular direction. And they saw it as their task to lay before people the ability to ride out their own rhythm and rule uh, as a way of swimming to the destination they wanted to go to rather than just being swept along with the other shipwrecked yeah, people. That's really, Isn't that a great yeah, image? Yeah, that's great. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. So this has been a problem throughout history. If you want to be deeply formed in the way of Christ or in any way, if you want to get a project done, if you want to drop some weight or, mm -hmm. you know, get more productive this year, um, you're going to have to swim for it. Mm -hmm. And you better know where you're, you're swimming toward. And, yeah. And, yeah. Yeah, totally. Now, the thing is, I find this, uh, <clears throat> this whole conversation is very counterintuitive mm -hmm. to the uh, church that I knew and that I've grown up in and what I find a lot of pushback. I get a lot of pushback because I find in the church world mm. something's not considered real unless it's uh, unplanned. Yeah, you know? right. So we're talking about developing a plan of practice for our lives. Yeah. And in the church world, you're, it's not real unless it's spontaneous. Yeah. It's not real unless it's unplanned. You know, a prayer mm. doesn't have power unless it just comes from your or your mind yeah. if you're reading somebody else's words then it takes away from the power you know yeah that whole idea yeah what is that i don't know the origins of that but we used to call it the, the cult of authenticity 
Yeah. You know, we're all bound to this thing that if it doesn't feel authentic and yeah. real, then it's not, it doesn't count. Yeah. So I, well, I, I, I don't know, but I can tell you th that there were people, I just referenced the early days of Becker's Table that were so hard, like any church plant is, but I can tell you there were people that um, as they were leaving the church would say things like, well, the Holy Spirit's not here because if the Holy Spirit was here, it wouldn't be hard. <laughs> What oh, is that? Oh. Where does that come from? Yes. Like if God was here, this would just explode and, and we would all just sit around amazed at all the amazing things happening. Like there, there is a real prejudice against hard work yeah. and plans and strategies and structures in right. evangelicalism. There right. really is. Well, there, Am I telling you something that you don't you know? know? There's a, yeah. yeah, you're... You're scratching the surface of a whole bunch of issues. Yeah. <laughs> They're deeply troubling. Yeah. 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 So I mean among at the core of which is this idea that that we think that for something to be healthy or good for us, it ought to come easily or mm -hmm. naturally. Mm -hmm. And when in fact the fact is most of what comes easily and naturally to us is terrible for us. Yeah. And most of what is good and, and worth doing requires some some self discipline yeah. and some intention. As well as this idea that if something is of God, then it just comes without effort. So, yeah. Rustin, some people, I have had this pushback before, and I want to hear what your mm -hmm. response would be. Some people would say, you know what, I, I don't want to talk about my role in bringing about transformation mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and remembering who I am, because it's all Jesus. Yeah. It's all Jesus, and it's, it's none of it's me. And, and so we can talk about what God is doing or Jesus is doing to me, but I can't talk about, you know, me. Yeah. And that's, that's like, for some people, that sounds like hypocrisy yeah. or, yeah, or heresy. Afraid, yeah, yeah, works salvation or that we're works saving salvation. our salvation. Yeah. yeah, there's lots of... But here we are talking about, no, we need a plan. We have to work. Yeah, you're going to have to do it. You're going to have to swim if mm -hmm. you're going to be saved. Um, now, this is tricky. And you got to rightly, and, you know, I always pause and comma, rightly understood. This is not uh, easy stuff, it's nuanced, but I mm -hmm. always go to this. Mm -hmm. uh, second, uh, second chapter of Philippians, Philippians mm -hmm. 2, 12 and 13. Listen for paradox. I always okay. say, get used to paradox if you're gonna be a Christian, right? Yeah. Uh, paradox is how you know something's getting at the truth. This is Paul writing and he says, therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only, now I, I kinda wanna pause there and rant, but <laughs> as you have always, always I mean, obeyed. Yeah. You think of Paul as as manipulative as we are yeah. as a pastor? <laughs> yeah. Calling out the very best. Have they really always obeyed? I kind of doubt it. Right. But he's seeing them for the best. There. I like and, that. And then, thank goodness, because um, that's what you do with me. You think of, you think well of me. I was even, just thinking that. I don't really live up that's to That's what we need to do as pastors. Yeah. We look at our people and we go, I'm, yeah. I'm going to think the best of you. Yeah. yeah. That's what we yeah. do with friends. That's yeah. what we do with friends. Yeah. 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 That's true. <laughs> <laughs> a little close to home when I say it like that. Therefore, my dear friends, <laughs> as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, now get this, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So that's the first half of it. Work out your salvation with you fear. You do this. You do it with yeah. fear and trembling. That doesn't mm -hmm. sound like fun. Sounds like hard work. It sounds like hard work. I mean, it sounds like fear and trembling. That's mm -hmm. what he said. Okay, so that's the first half of it. Work it out. Work out your salvation. Verse 13. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Mm -hmm. I mean, there it is. I think of that as paradox because it's the two things true at the same time that seem to be contradictory. Work out your salvation. In other words, you do it. You swim for it. Because at the same time that you're doing that, it's not you doing it. It's God doing it in you. Mm -hmm. That's a, a uh, beautiful tension. Yeah. Yeah. It, that's right. Yeah. Beautiful. It's a beautiful tension. And I got to say, that's been true of my experience and what little transformation I've actually had in my life. Uh, I, can, I can point to seasons of working really hard at something. Forgiveness is one. One time a decade ago, I had a real, real bitter relationship with a guy who's a really good friend now. Um, really struggled with forgiveness in that relationship. Worked at it, worked at it, read books on it, got counseling, you know, sought yeah. advice, prayed, uh, did all the things. And then one day, uh, I forgave him. And 
it was almost as if it was something that happened to me rather than something I did. Mm -hmm. Now, I know I put in all the work mm -hmm. to do it, but when it finally happened, it felt like it had nothing to do with me. Yeah. And that, that was kind of the first time I ran into this in Philippians and this idea that you work it out, but it's God that works in you. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. It feels like grace when it happens. I think that's yeah. something to do with grace. And my question is, and I don't think there's an answer to this, but I, I always wonder, like, would, would that grace have come to me had I not done all the work to prepare myself to receive what, what ultimately God had right. to do inside me? That's a great question. And, I mean, nobody can answer that. Because I, I kind of want to say, no, I wouldn't have. But, I mean, none, none of us know. I mean, right? I mean, because no. a lot of, sometimes there are things that God works in us when we don't, you know, deserve, haven't worked for it. But, but still, Certainly. we have this this um calling i think and that is to um, i like the way that ronald rollheiser puts it he says we have a calling to give birth to faith mm -hmm. um and and that's really that's important to talk about right now yeah. in christmas season mm -hmm. uh here we are celebrating christmas and i really think rustin that we can use uh, mary as an analogy mm -hmm. to giving birth as she gave birth to christ which involves much more than just the moment of giving birth. It involves raising and nurturing a child. And, and I'm going to talk about that. I'm using Rollheiser's idea here. And, and I think this is really beautiful. But he says, you know, we, we have to remember that you and I and the church is here to, 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 so that the word can become flesh. Mm -hmm. This is what we celebrate in Christmas, that the word became flesh. Yeah. But too often, he says, we get that backwards in the fl we, we make the flesh become word, <laughs> you know, um, and, and so we... Uh, so, what, so what do you mean by that? What comes to my mind is the flesh being that which comes naturally. Yeah, yeah. I, I, what I see, like when I read that, I envision the church um, focusing less and less on the way that we live and working out our faith, like you mm -hmm. just read, and more and more on just... Um, ideas mm -hmm. and uh, in 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 understanding concepts yeah. and uh praising you know where it's where, where we can become really bound to what we call the word mm -hmm. the word of god which is important but the whole idea is that mm -hmm. that word becomes fleshed out yeah, but, we, but we lose that because that's the hard part everything mm -hmm. that we're talking about right mm -hmm. now is the hard part mm -hmm. this is the work yeah. but our job is the hard part that we do with god right as mm -hmm. co-partners with god yeah. the hard part is making the word flesh. Mm -hmm. So we're giving birth. As Mary gave birth to Christ, we're giving birth to our faith. Mm -hmm. and, and I want my faith to be birthed from me so that it becomes this presence in the world that, mm -hmm. is, that has an impact and, and, and makes a difference. Yeah. So, again, reading from Rollheiser, he says, Faith is meant to be born, to come into the world. The word of God became flesh. It's not the other way around. Mm -hmm. So we, what we can do is we can look at, at Mary at Christmas time, and that she gave birth to Christ, and we see that it's not something done in an instant. Faith is a lot like biology in the fact that it relies on the process. Mm. <laughs> Our faith relies on the process, mm. and there are a number of distinct moments in that process that are, are very organic moments, but they are all part of this long plan, this process to bring faith to life. So he outlines them. He says, first, we all need to get pregnant by the Holy Spirit, which is, of course, where Mary started. Mm -hmm. So in other words, we let the word of God, this great thing, the word of God, we let it take root inside yeah. of us. Yeah. And it becomes part of who we are. And, and so it becomes part of our flesh, therefore. Yeah. Yeah. Which itself is an act that requires our cooperation. We, ha we have to put ourselves in positions where the word is going to be ingested. Exactly. Right? Yeah. yeah. Now, we lovingly, as any mother would, uh, gestate mm. and nurture and protect the faith that is growing inside of us. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think this is a long process, but we want it to survive in, in us as it gets ready to go out to the world. Again, this is an analogy, but we can yeah. think of it this way. And this yep. is largely where a plan is needed. Like, how is your faith going to gestate mm. in you? If you just ignore it, it probably won't grow healthy in the same way a baby inside of a mom is not going to grow healthy if she just ignores it, you know, and continues 
<laughs> drinking and smoking or whatever it is, yeah. right? So yeah. we uh, don't. T- I didn't mean that in any kind of literal. No, uh, I mean smoke away. I, yeah. I guess. No, that's not. What <laughs> I am not condemning drinking and smoking. So um, don't think when you listen to me teach, never think literally. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Then she says, um, we must give, or Rawlheiser says, then um, we have to give birth to that faith that's in us. Um, But as any mom could tell you, giving birth to a a baby is more, again, than just that moment. It's Mm. years of nurturing and coaxing and conjoling the mm-hmm. infant into adulthood. Mm-hmm. And, and that's what we're growing, you know. So for Mary, baby Jesus had to become the man Jesus. Yeah. And we celebrate baby Jesus at Christmas. That's the famous icon of Christmas. But you and I, everybody knows, it's not baby Jesus who healed people. It's mm-hmm. not baby Jesus who, who preached. Yeah. And it's not baby Jesus who died for us, you know. Yeah. Baby Jesus had to become the man Jesus. And of course, Mary plays an important role in that. Yeah. She has to nurture this and, and in the same way, we have to nurture our faith into adulthood. Mm-hmm. So I think that we referenced last week how th- some people insist mm-hmm. on their faith staying in kind of an infancy, yeah. Yeah. and they insist on the church being a place that treats them as infants, yeah. where the rest of the world they can be grown ups. But in the church, it's all about. Yeah. But but we we need to not do that. Yeah. We need I to mean, be even even Paul. I'm thinking of Paul's metaphor. We rise to the church and talks about that very metaphor of moving yeah. on beyond milk. Yeah. into solid food. Yeah. Like grow, grow up. And I think that that's been one of the hallmarks of Beggar's Table, at least what I've been trying to do at Beggar's Table, is to create a place that's for people who are taking growing up seriously mm. in their faith. And, um, mm. and that has been incredibly rewarding, and it's gotten a lot of pushback. It depends on who the people are, right, and yeah. what they want. But all of that to say, we have to um, grow our infant, our infant faith into adulthood. Yeah. And then this next step, I so appreciated uh, when I read it, because we don't talk about it very often, but this is like, oh, thank you. This is so important. Mm -hmm. As the child grows and matures and takes on a personality of its own, we must do what Mary did and ponder. It causes us to stop and ponder. Mm -hmm. She must let herself, and and what he means is mothers, all mothers, Mm -hmm. have to allow themselves, if they're going to be healthy, to be painfully stretched in the way that they understand their child as they grow older, because mm-hmm. they're, there's going to come a point in time where their child begins to take on its own personality. And, and, and so yeah. mothers have to be painfully challenged yeah. in not knowing and not fully understanding their adult kid in carrying tension yeah. and then finally in letting go. So every healthy mom quits being Beverly Goldberg at some point and, and just lets go. You know what I mean? She must set free, set her child free to be itself something that was once so fiercely hers. Mm-hmm. The pains of childbirth are often gentle compared to this second wrenching for every mom. Mm-hmm. For Mary probably as well because she had something to really release her child into that was not easy for any yeah. mom. And, um, but this is, the thing is, this is true of our faith. We nurture it, we grow it into adulthood, and then our faith becomes something that makes us stop and ponder. And it kind of takes us on a personality, and we have to live with the tension yeah. that it brings to us. Yeah. Yeah? Does yeah. that make sense? Paradox. Yeah. The paradox. Yeah. So again, I'm, I'm yeah. reading no, from... That's a great metaphor. Yeah. Yeah, I, I really love that, especially for Christmas time. And mm-hmm. I, I, I'm reading from Rollheiser here. He says, our task... Two is to give birth to Christ. Mm-hmm. Mary is the paradigm for doing that. Now, I love this, Rustin. I'm, I'm like, well, here's Advent season next year, you know, because I, I, I would love to lean into Mary. But mm-hmm. it says, from her, we get the pattern. Mm-hmm. Let the word, <coughs> sorry, let the word of God take root and make you pregnant. Mm-hmm. Just state that by giving it the nourishment or the nourishing sustenance of your own life, which is really what, we do when yeah mm-hmm. submit to the pain three that is demanded for it to be born to the outside and then spend years coaxing it from infancy to adulthood mm-hmm. now, if you don't have a plan for that it's going to be really hard mm-hmm. and finally during and after all of this do some pondering mm-hmm. accept the pain of not understanding and letting go this is all a healthy process of growing faith in us, which is another way of saying transforming ourselves into the image of Christ. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. And I see the resonant uh, metaphor there 
in our overall faith journey, but that also resonates or parallels to things like New, New Year's resolutions and, or art projects or mm -hmm. uh, whatever it is that we want to give birth to in yeah. the world. Yeah. It's going to stretch us uh, and we better be ready to cultivate and make space for it to grow healthily. Exactly. Yeah. In the passage I brought from scripture, uh, it kind of goes along with your Philippians verse uh, because it, it also uses the word obedience. Mm. And the, the interesting thing is when we read the, the, the word obedient or obey in mm. the New Testament, it, it, it often has something to, it, it often means um, working, like uh, putting a plan into practice, mm. um, having some kind of intentionality behind mm. what we're doing. So obey, sometimes when we hear obey, we think of a dictator yeah. saying, here are rules, and then I follow those rules, right. and that's obedience. Yeah. There's some truth in that, but, but obey, when, when Paul wrote that passage in Philippians, what he was getting at is just as you've been obedient, and so he's saying, just as, just as you've been working, mm -hmm. just as you have been putting plans into practice and really working out your, you know, continue mm -hmm. to do that. Um, so this is what Jesus means, work out your faith. Mm -hmm. uh, so what I brought is Luke, chapter 11. This is verses 27 and 28. And I just love the. To me, this is a whole story in just two verses. Okay. As Jesus was saying these things, by the way, he's been talking about um, demons and, and, and um, being free of, yeah. of demonic power. So it's, yeah. But as he was saying these things, a woman in the crowd called out, Blessed is the mother who gave you birth and nursed you. What we just got through talking about. Yeah. This woman is awesome. She recognizes that mothering is hard and that giving birth is a huge process. And blessed is Mary. And we agree with her. Yeah. We all say, yeah, wow, blessed yeah. is the mom who did that. Whenever I meet someone I really like, I want to say, hey, blessed is your mom. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, because this didn't just happen. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you know, for me to like you, there's been some real formation yeah. and some real <laughs> motherly nurturing. Yeah. But then the, the great part is in verse 28 where Jesus replies and he says, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. Um, <laughs> which sounds really prickly, but, but I think that what Jesus is saying, I mean, Luke didn't write that he said thank you, but I like to imagine that he said yeah. thank you. Yeah. But, Instead of actually. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I just want to point out that the people who are really blessed are all of the people who are doing the work that my mom did, mm. you know, oh, the, the people, good. the people yeah. who are really blessed are the people who are hearing me yeah. and obeying, but working at it, like putting yeah. plans into practice and being the, being, becoming the nurturing mother yeah. of, uh, of, just... of everything that I'm talking about yeah. so that they are also giving birth. Yeah. You know what I All mean? All those who are, are receiving this mm -hmm. little life and making room for it to grow in healthy ways and then to go out into the world and to release it to bless others. Mm -hmm. The people who participate in that are the ones who are blessed. Who are actually oh, giving birth. That's really rich, man. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. So um, anyway, all all props to Ronald Rollheiser for that. Mm. But um, I didn't ask you this ahead of time, so I'm just throwing this at you. But before we leave this mm. conversation, do you have any like practical plans of practice that people could put into place? Like, if people are going, what would that look mm -hmm. like? I mean, I think that it can range from really simple to mm -hmm. more complex. But yeah. I mean, obviously, there are uh, things like personal quiet times and. Yeah. Um, as with scripture yeah. memorization that we've talked about before and yeah, yeah so no there are those basic ones I mean yeah. silence and scripture uh, you know solitude and scripture reading mm -hmm. always I always would say that generally for a general audience beyond that it gets tougher and I I find this stuff to be so important to the to the Christian life and yet so hard to teach to a wide audience like mm -hmm. this is better done in conversation mm -hmm. uh, because what works for you is not going to work for somebody else and vice versa you know yeah. I always say what what's a life preserver to one person is like cement shoes to another person it's really true that's a great it's, point and, I'm glad and we it's can not, say that it's not only true between people but it's true with yourself and so yeah. I every year you know or more often than a year probably renew uh, my own kind of personal practice of what I call a rule of life uh, but it has to change over time because sometimes the things that were bringing life to me or helping me a year ago are no longer working for mm -hmm. me. But so 
it's really great for people to hear that that's yeah. okay. Yeah, the point is not the rule of life. The point is the life, the life. that the rule yeah. makes room for. Because we kill ourselves with yeah. our shoulds. The, like, I should, right. you, you should have a quiet time. You should memorize all this. And then people are like, uh, and, and, yeah. and I shouldn't ever change. And yes. the things that nurtured last year, my faith, are not nurturing that's this year. That's right. Yeah. As Brendan Manning once provocatively said, you're shooting all over yourself. Yeah, yep, yep. Yeah. So this need not be guilt-driven. It's life. It's freedom. It's invitation into a larger life. Yeah. Uh, but a rule of life helps protect that life, you know, yeah. and uh, so the Christians have known this, you know, for nearly the whole time of, of church history, the rule of life. And the way I just generally help with others and with myself is I begin with things that are, oh, these are just widely known through history. You can talk about, I mean, first of all, don't get any grandiose ideas about major, major change. Sometimes that's necessary for you know, emergency reasons, but in general, a great place to begin thinking about uh, a rule of life or a rhythm of life is with what already works and doesn't work. And so the, the traditional language for that is consolation and desolation. So there are things in your life right now that when you do them, they are bringing health to your life mm-hmm. or you're feeling closer to God or whatever mm-hmm. language you want to put to it. Um, I feel connected to God. That's language I like when I'm doing these kinds of things. Well, I'd put that in the category of things that are consoling, consolation. When I do these kinds of things, I feel separated from others or from God or from myself or I'm more grumpy or irritated or uh, in negative ways. Mm -hmm. Uh, Those are desolations. So I can begin a rule of life just by making a list of like, here's some things that aren't going so well. When I indulge these activities, not good. When I indulge these activities, I tend to stay more present and and inspired and connected. Mm -hmm. So I like to begin there. And for me, I'll just, I can, I don't mind sharing um, just some of the basic things. It's always begins very simple. Sleeping, uh, eating, exercising. So those are things I actually name in my rule of life. So here's how it goes. If I'm having a bad day um, or a bad few days, um, what I'll often discipline myself to do now is to go back to my rule of life and go, what, what am I not doing well? Often it's, oh, sleep. Sleep's that first one. And I'm not sleeping very well. I'm staying up too late because, you know, mm-hmm. my schedule's crazy. You don't have to be anywhere anytime. So I just work when I want to, you know, feel... Yeah. And for me, I'm a night owl, so I end up staying up too late, and then I get up too early for how late I went to bed, and I'm not mm-hmm. getting enough sleep. And after a few days of that, I start to feel a little melancholy. Mm-hmm. So instead of going, oh, no, everything's wrong, and my relationships are terrible, and I need a new job, I go, oh, I'm not getting enough sleep. Yeah. So I go back to my rule of life and go, I'm going to fix my sleep yeah. schedule. Now, if I'm getting enough sleep, I go to the next thing. How am I eating? Oh, it's Christmas time. Not very well. <laughs> so that, yeah. So that's probably why I'm not doing great. Mm-hmm. So I'll fix that. And then I go down the list. And for me, there were other things on my list always like exercise or just some kind of movement. Uh, for me, cre- doing something creative, mm-hmm. um, doing something bodily creative, like playing guitar or sketching or something like that. And regular conversation with a friend who reads books, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. so, so you're part of my discipline. I have a few other friends that if I can get at least one good conversation in every week, I just feel happier. Uh, so that's part of my real life. And sometimes I can be doing everything else all well, but feel a little disconnected from God. And I look at the list and go, man, I, yeah. I haven't seen, I haven't any, had any real rich conversations in a couple of weeks. And I'm just feeling lonesome. <laughs> <laughs> right? I have this image of w- when I went on sabbatical a couple of years ago, I remember like halfway through my sabbatical, I started getting texts from you. Yeah. Going, Where are you coming back? Yeah, you did. <laughs> I miss you. <laughs> <laughs> what are you reading? Yeah. Tell me about the movie that you've seen. <laughs> huh? give, me, awesome. give me some great metaphor that. about giving birth to things in the world. Right? <laughs> I need something. You know, that, that. But that's part of what connects me to God and to myself. It keeps me present. And so it's part of my rule of life. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's beautiful. Yeah. And you know, the thing is, it, it makes me, that, that's why I brought up the Steal Like an Artist book in mm-hmm. his subsequent books, because I, I love, you know, we talked a couple of weeks ago about seeing God in everything yeah. and holding God before our minds. And, and I just think, I love it when I can see the gospel and people don't even know they're being gospel. And in yeah. Austin Kleon's writing this book about being creative, but what he's doing is he's outlining having a rule of life. Yeah. He says, he just said, we have to have a routine. A routine protects us That's from right. feeling. And then, and then you read his book 
book and it's about have a list make a list of the things that you need you know and the, yeah. what you want and here's where you know have a space where you put yourself every day and you know yeah. and he's outlining for everyone how to build this rule of life yeah because he knows that that's part of the giving birth process. Oh, that's so yeah. good. And I think the real encouragement in all of that is that when you start talking about high and lofty things like spiritual disciplines and rules of life, these aren't, these aren't highly uh, unachievable things. No. These are things that largely we already do yeah. and, and you can do without, without massive uh, upheaval yeah. in, your, in your life. In a lot of cases, like you're probably already doing some great things. You can just write those down and count them yeah. as part of your rule and lean into them more. Yeah. And, and of course, there's always going to be adjustments. But for me, there's adjustments throughout the year as the, as the seasons shift and my family rhythms change. Like some things that work for me here don't work here. And, mm -hmm. and I have to make different arrangements. And sometimes in every year I get really ambitious and put something on my rule of life where I'm, I'm going to do something great with this. And those usually fail, but I, <laughs> I don't mind trying. That's part of the rule, too. Yeah, that's beautiful. <laughs> Well, I would, before we go, I would just direct everyone back to what we've already talked about in this series, because I think that as we look at our plan and practice and yeah. what we want that to be for us, yeah. I think it needs to involve, um, let alone, it, it needs to begin with remembering who we are because yeah. God created us and yeah. he loves us regardless of who, what we do. You but, will, we'll, we will never be at our best if we act out of any other center than yeah. remembering who in Christ we are. Yeah, so I think whatever it takes to help you uh, and, and us to remember that every day is a great yeah. thing. Yeah. But I, um, I, I also encourage people to revisit what we think, yeah. like what we hold before our minds, yeah. and, and how, we, how we develop that discipline, and, yeah. and what we do, yeah. um, how we live, and um, how we relate. Yes. All of those things are part of that plan of practice. And then I love that idea that there's no black and white program for this that we're yeah. going to put before you. Yeah. You need to be a creative. We are all born that way, to be a creative. Yeah. Come up those, with I've just thought though those three categories of the first three weeks of the series might, might be good categories to, to write out. What, what are we doing to cultivate space for me to remember who I am? What am I doing to keep God before my mind? Or, um, and then how am I connected to the people around me? And mm -hmm. am I really living my life as part of something larger than just me? Yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. Well, Rustin, thanks for partnering with me yeah, and uh, in this in this teaching series, and I'm happy to partner with you as well. So, um, beginning again is what we're doing right now, and yeah. uh, I'm sure we're going to have a lot of moments of beginning again as this year unfolds. Yeah. Um, but I but I know that I look forward to continuing to uh, team teach with you in different ways as the, yeah. and may, and, and very likely continuing to do this in some uh, yeah. form or another as we continue on down. The road. Yeah, well, blessings on you and, yeah. and the whole Beggars Table community from all of us at Vox. We all we pray for you guys and I know you pray for us and yeah, it's been good to stay connected uh, during this time. Yeah, blessings to Vox as well mm -hmm. and. Uh, I love that uh, my people have had a chance to hear you preach, and it's yeah. just, it's all really good. So, right. peace. Yeah, peace to you, John. All right.